in this map of the Italian peninsula, we can point out where we will visit with this tape. Here in the Aeolian Islands, just off the north coast of Sicily, we will also go up to Lardarello in Tuscany and look at geothermal production, the historic geothermal production there. And we'll end the tape with a view to the problems, the geothermal problems at Naples. In the Aeolian Islands, we will visit Volcano itself and Lipari. In Tuscany, we will visit the world's oldest geothermal exploitation. And in Naples, we'll both go to Vesuvius and to Solfatera, south and north of Naples itself, to see what the geothermal problems really are in the Naples area. Before we go to the Aeolian Islands by hydrofoil across the Mediterranean, let's take just a moment to look at this postcard, compliments of the British Museum, showing the cross-section of the kind of volcano that comprises most of the Aeolian Islands. Notice the plumbing system that comes from depth and spews forth alternatively lava and ash, making the so-called stratovolcano. The plumbing system may have side chutes, such as shown here off to the left, and we'll see that when we get to Volcano, that there is indeed a side chute, a small satellite cone called, not surprisingly, Volcanella. Volcano is surrounded by Mediterranean seawater, and much of the water goes into the volcano to evaporate, leaving salt deposits behind which react with further steam to make hydrochloric acid. Here with the hydrofoil, we will in fact travel over to the Aeolian Islands and see some of this in three dimensions that we've just seen in cross-section with the postcard. The hydrofoil is a very interesting means of locomotion used a lot in the Mediterranean. Perhaps you can see in the view now up that there are two foils that stick out and these boats can make easily 30 miles an hour even in fairly rough water. The idea of going back and forth between the islands is necessary as shown by the map now before you. Notice Volcano which has the idea of geothermal energy being produced and distributed to the other islands. We will visit Lipari where we'll see stone products from the volcanoes being mined but the tape will not be long enough to visit all the other Aeolian islands. Been one devil of a climb up here. There's the true summit. And here's kind of a collapsed caldera. The caldera is, as the word cauldron might signify, the fire pit so that if there were really magma at the summit of Volcano at this time, this would po probably be where it would collect first. It's a very large negative feature right in the summit, and I'm panning back now to try to give you some idea of the size, but I can't go back completely because of the sun angle and the possibility of hurting the camera with the sun angle uh, utilized. Notice the collapse feature in the floor of the caldera itself. To the summit. You can see some people there for scale. The fumaroles. For the wind blowing the hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide, hydrogen chloride rich gases out of the summit. More. And then for the long view, an older side wall. And out to the blue. Mediterranean. The isthmus. For the waves coming in. And this is Volcanella. Recall the postcard where we showed the side chute in the plumbing system. This is indeed the side chute off the main volcano itself. Vents in the isthmus and in the summit of Volcano are noteworthy. You can see some white crystals, perhaps. Long needles. These are ammonium chloride. <coughs> the coin is turning black from the sulfuric acid. It was a nice shiny nickel coin made from nickel metal. And it's turning to nickel sulfide literally as you watch. Crystals. You 
can see there's some bliming and re-precipitating here in the bokeh. <coughs> Heat has melted the Fisher Scientific Scale Ruler. Perhaps you can hear the sizzling. That's all I can do to talk. <coughs> the fumes are tremendously bad. in the Mediterranean Sea. It was Mother Nature's fireworks. Ivan Barnes at Nomo Park has just finished a survey of this gas. <clears throat> My throat agrees. It's 1.1 normal in HCl. has a high CO2 content, obviously a high sulfur content. And you can see ammonium chloride crystals also about a half inch long if you get your nose right down in it. But who wants to? It's beautiful to watch as the Mediterranean wind is blowing this to the west over the caldera rim. Beginning the descent back down to the ship. I'd better get myself in gear too or I'll be left behind. By hydrofoil now on to Lipari is noted for its stone products such as ash and pumice. The pumice is actually called Leperite in honor of the island. Notice the spilled ash here where on the dock various ships have loaded and it has turned the Mediterranean various milky shades of blue. Another of the stone products from Lipari is the obsidian, which has been mined by civilizations for at least as long as 2000 BC. The obsidian is volcanic glass and tool makers in ancient Stone Age civilizations could make very sharp edges with this material. Hence, tribes came here to mine it. Notice the conchoidal fracture. used in blocks for cosmetic, for cuticle or bunion removal. In the loose form it's used as an aggregate material for plaster, lightweight aggregate filler. It's essentially uh, vesicular glass or frost, glass frost from a very gassy eruption here at Lipari. Notice that the ash beds in this view are inclined upward and to the left. That, of course, is as it should be, since they are pointing to the summit in that regard. Dr. Helgeson, <laughs> right into the lens, scrunch, crunch, right? <laughs> Thank you. Too much. Get into cosmetic pumice stones. so that I don't fall over the wall here. try to recapitulate what it is that we have learned on our trip. In the preceding footage, we have discussed in terms of the Aeolian Islands some of the geothermal problems and some of the geothermal promises that do exist. 
the idea that there are many stone products that have been mined since before Christ, obsidian, we have looked at on Lipari. The idea that Marco Polo came back from China with the idea of gunpowder and necessitated the mining of sulfur, one of the components of gunpowder, was also done at the Aeolian Islands. There has been a lot of use of the loose aggregate, lightweight material, the ash, for several different purposes. The cosmetic use of pumice for bunion removal. And of course, the more important idea of using geothermal energy with the possibility of their heat leaking from the volcano being turned into electricity is just a partial list of some of the promises that can occur. On the negative side of things, there can be a great deal of problems with the idea of geothermal exploitation. To think about actively provoking a volcano by injecting water to make steam for electric production is to perhaps worry about the eruption potential of the volcano. If the volcano does start to erupt, it's very clear that toxic gases will be involved from what we've seen at Volcano. Pollution, uh, the toxic gases such as carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, ammonia, hydrogen chloride, sulfur dioxide, all of which when mixed with water can make some type of dilute acids. The idea perhaps more in the sense of plumbing, that if one is to inject water into the summit of a volcano in the attempt to make hydropower or geothermal power more properly, that the clogging of the plumbing could easily occur. Two types of clogging, in other words, if the lava coming up freezes in the plumbing system, that's Mother Nature's clogging, but when water is injected, it's highly likely that there could be a clogging just by dissolved minerals as the water comes to the summit and cools off and its dissolved mineral content is left behind in the throat of the plumbing system. That of course is just like happens in a household on a longer time frame, taking 20 to 30 years in the plumbing of a house. It may occur in just a few moments, if not a few days, in the plumbing system of a volcano as mineral deposits form as we've seen in some of the bocas or mounts at the summit. Societal threats having to do with the exploitation of geothermal energy can be very real. Perhaps most of us in Tom Terminus, United States, had never thought much about volcanological problems because there had never been any major eruption until 1980 when Mount St. Helens cut loose. In some file footage kindly supplied by WCAU Channel 10 in Philadelphia from Good Friday's newscast, we can see exactly... Mount St. Helens has been in a nasty mood for the last two weeks, spitting steam and hot ash for over 100 miles. The last time she got upset was over 100 years ago, but when it was all over, there had been no damage. But this time, there is a real danger that she will blow her stack, and that could cause hundreds of deaths or injuries and millions of dollars in property damage. Yesterday, Governor Dixie Ray Lee ordered an evacuation of the 15 miles surrounding the volcano. Experts say it was a good move, pointing out that 30,000 people were killed by a similar volcanic eruption on the island of Martinique in 1902, and there's no telling when Mount St. Helens could explode. The eruption could come in two, two different modes. One would be simply with liquid uh, magma flowing down the, the hillside in response to gravity, perhaps 10, 15 miles an hour. That is not particularly the dangerous mode because you could even outrun that if you were forced to. But what the second mode of eruption could be is that the gas pressure inside the summit builds to the point where it blows the summit. Dr. Gene Ulmer of Temple University told me tonight that the heat alone has already caused some damage. No surprise when you consider temperatures inside the volcano reach over 1,200 degrees Celsius. Poisonous gases that could blow as far as 100 miles over Washington State and Oregon. The, the chemistry of the steam, uh, the, the white uh, gas triggering uh, the bringing out of the, the ash and so forth, is pretty toxic in its own right. Prolonged inhalation, uh, very typically it would contain uh, chlorine and sulfur dioxide, which in combination with the moisture make dilute acids and certainly very corrosive on property as well as lungs. We'll leave the Aeolian Islands and go to Larderello to learn what we can learn about geothermal energy at this world historic area. 
the cross-section of the Earth might be helpful in our thinking about Lardarello. The idea that the Earth is about 5,000 miles in radius and that in the core of the Earth there are exceedingly hot temperatures supposed in the inner and outer core just now being pointed out. Temperatures there may be in excess of two or 3,000, perhaps even 4,000 degrees centigrade. Along the radius then there is a drop from the core of the Earth outward about 5,000 kilometers so that at the surface, at least in the temperate climates where we do live, the temperature has dropped there at the surface to about 20 degrees centigrade. The idea that there is a temperature drop then can be investigated in terms of geothermal energy. There are perhaps three major types of geothermal energy, steady state, hot spots, and geopressurized zones. The steady state involves a value of about one quarter of a microwatt per square meter per second. The steady state would be anywhere in the absence of a hot spot or a geopressurized zone. Microwatt per square meter or per square yard per second is the unit of the geothermal flow. A light bulb, such as a 60 watt light bulb, can be thought of in terms of microwatts or at least in terms of watts. Each second, 60 watt seconds of power would be involved. Micro is the prefix meaning a millionth of, and so the unit microwatt per square meter per second can be also thought about a millionth of a watt per square meter or per yard, if that makes easier to think about, per second. And with regards to steady state areas away from hot spots or geopressurized zones, about one quarter of one microwatt per square meter per second is the energy outflow. On the other hand, in hot spots, particularly as in volcanic areas with lava pouring out at about 1200 degrees centigrade, or in plutonic areas where the molten rock has not yet surfaced to the surface, we have considerably higher microwatt rating for these types of areas. 250 microwatts as opposed to a quarter for a volcanic emanation, about 25, a maximum of 25 microwatts in the plutonic areas coming through the roof rocks and heating the overlying portion of the crust of the Earth. The plutonic areas are most familiar perhaps to North Americans in the sense of our famous park Yellowstone, where molten material, perhaps already solidified through millions of years of cooling, underlies the park and the heat flow, of, which can be expressed as 25 or nearly 25 microwatts per square meter per second, gives rise to all the hot thermal phenomena such as Old Faithful and the mud pots and the heated springs that do make Yellowstone so interesting. In our visit at Lardarello, it is very likely a plutonic type area, something like Yellowstone, which has had since early times plutonic hotspot activity. Later in the tape, we will see a geopressurized zone that is inferred to be under Naples and contrast with the plutonic zone that's under Lardarello. Here we are in the Tuscany Mountains now at Lardarello at a very interesting museum which recounts the history of this area of geothermal development. The idea that the area was known on maps of the third century is shown here in the scene before you. It's a Latin entitled map talking about warm baths uh, in the river that runs through the Tuscany Mountains. So the hot springs and the geothermal area have been known since the third century. About ten centuries later, on the map now appearing on the screen, shows an area in the northern coast of Italy in about 1500. And in the portion that's shaded now zooming in on, you see Mount Cheriberi, which is in honor of Caribus, the dog who guarded the gates of hell, and the natural steam leaking from the ground was known in the Mount Cheriberi region. In about 1800, a political leftist by all accounts from France, the Cavalieri Lardarel, was given a land grant in the Tuscany mountains for political favors, and he came there and founded a community dedicated to the 
extraction of boric acid from the steam issuing it from the ground. The community that he founded was an experiment in socialism. The preceding scene was a factory for widows and orphans of the workers in his uh, boric acid extraction. And this scene here shows some of the leftover apothecary jars from a pharmacy which he also founded for his workers. Thus, this was an experiment both in socialism of a kind and also in very early geologic and geochemical extraction of boron. Here we see a ledger sheet, for instance, detailing, if your Italian is good, uh, boric acid production in Tuscany. And it's quite interesting to see the date here is 1882. The production of boron continued to dominate, but in about 1904, the production of electricity did begin. Lardarello then is, as this says, the most ancient industrial geothermally active area exploited in the world. It's showing the idea of geothermal fluids for chemical processes, and in 1904, the first electric power production. That's pretty amazing when you think of Edison's light bulb development in about the same period of time, certainly within five years. Despite the destruction of the plants in World War II, you can see that by 1980, the production was 450,000 kilowatts. I thought it might be fun to go outside and trace the steam from beginning to end in the production of geothermal electricity. seen the steam above ground. In a few minutes we'll consider where it comes from from below ground. But what great hospitality of the Italians here to open the pipe and let us see the energy in the pipe. As the steam leaves the well or the pipeline as we just saw and comes indoors it is used to turn turbines which twist wires inside of a fixed magnetic field thereby generating the electricity. Here we're seeing one of the turbines with its cover removed and you see some rags laying there which are being used to clean the turbine blades. The minerals dissolved in the steam don't attack the turbine blade, but instead deposit on it, and it makes it necessary to clean each turbine once about every two years. In other areas of the world where this is a much more severe problem, a heat exchanger is used to isolate the turbine blades from the corrosive vapors. After the steam leaves the turbine, it goes out through a cooling tower reminiscent of nuclear cooling towers in the United States, and the temperature is left escape through the cooling tower and the steam in terms of cooled water is re-injected in some cases at temperatures at about 75 degrees centigrade. Here we see some of the pipes collecting steam from across the countryside from various wells and bringing them to the turbine uh, house where the centralization of the power generation can take place. So we have seen the steam come up from the ground be used to generate electricity then the transmission leaves the plant and the water is recondensed to steam and put back in the ground. Here in the museum we realize that not only was the development of geochemistry and geothermal electricity a first at Lardarello, but indeed the very history of drilling is, as being shown here in these models, developed at Lardarello. These first two drills were in fact hand-turned and it's amazing to believe that they could drill with only hand and shoulder and grease power, elbow grease, to depths of a couple hundred feet. You see the dates here. In the mid-1800s, uh, there was still not a motorized drill. They were using uh, tools and developing coring tools actually here for the rest of the world. As early as World War II, it was still pretty much hand drilling, and only after World War II to the drilling platforms here, as shown by the dates, begin to look like modern drills with elevated platforms, clutches and motors, and no longer using just uh, back and muscle power, but using engines to turn the drills. So the idea of drilling history here at Lardarello is also uh, quite true. 
the first hundred or so years then at Lardarello, the main emphasis was on drilling and exposing new wells to extract vapor so that the vapor could be used to extract boron from the vapor. Looking back down the Hall of History here, just again to remind ourselves that the whole history of drilling was developed at Lardarello. With the production of the vapor and the extraction of the boron, a great industry had been started by Count Lardarello, and the town, of course, now bears his name, Lardarello. This graph shows 100 years of activity at the Lardarello site, starting in about 1840 and going down to about just before World War II, 1938. There are three different curves being shown here in the 10-year increments of data. And the main thing at this end of the graph is how steep the rise was just before World War II of the production as indicated by the steepest line, which is total steam output. The line decreasing from the upper left to the lower right in steps is the actual tonnage of boron being extracted. And the lower curved line starting in the left and going over to the right gives you some idea of the amount of steam that was actually being tied up with uh, boron production. In World War II, as the Nazis retreated, they mined the wells and blew them so that the Allied powers got nothing from the wells. So production stopped at the end of World War II. The exact form of tools which are being used, uh, extractors, <laughs> percussion taps, uh, screw extractors, paddle wheels, and some of the early hand uh, elbow grease tools are shown here also. So we've talked about this, that drilling was, in fact, um, developed here at <laughs> Lardarello and the geothermal fields. The other kind of thing that was developed was the knowledge, the engineering knowledge, of how to handle blowouts and how to handle wells that were drilled that produced a tremendous pressure. In the early days, the holes that were drilled, the sidewalls were not cased. That is to say, they were not lined, and a pressure buildup occurred from the entire length of the hole. When the pressure got too large, a blowout would occur, such as this one in 1923. As a result of these kinds of accidents, much was learned about how to contain this kind of pressure in either a geothermal or a natural petroleum well. Casing was put in so that the production site of a well was only the last few feet, and furthermore, uh, T valves were put in at the top of the well where one would drill through the stem of the T and have valving off on both of the sidebars of the T so that some kind of pressure containment or pressure relief, as the case need, needed to be, could be achieved without losing control. Thus, we've looked at some of the history here at Lardarello. We've looked at how a geothermal plant works here, a model just to remind us of all that we've seen thus far. But we've left hanging one important question, and that's how does geothermal energy originate? Here with the use of a 1980 cartoon off of the cover of the Transactions of the American Geophysical Union uh, publication, we can look at some of the various features of geothermal energy. A typical geothermal well is depicted here, and it involves these jargon word things called aquitards, aquifers, and radiogenic uh, places in the crust of the Earth. It's well to think a little bit more about what these words uh, signify. In the sense of an aquitard, we're talking about, or an aquifer, uh, the Latin gives us some idea that we're talking about the movement of water through layers of the crust of the earth. The aquitard means a layer which retards the movement of water. An aquifer means a layer which, in fact, allows recharge from rain and so forth and water to pass down into the crust of the earth into an aquifer, the vertical motion of that water then may be retarded by an aquitard. This is sometimes referred to, to get the idea across smoothly, as an, as an aquifer sandwich, where there would be a porous layer capped with a non-porous layer. The other piece of the geothermal generation is, what is the temperature of the earth? And as indicated in this cartoon, it may be in a steady state or 30 or 60 degrees on these isotherms. But when we get in proximity to a radiogenic heated portion of the basement complex, that temperature may be driven up by the radioactive heat that's concentrated in such a plutonic mass. The heat then causes a higher temperature closer to the surface than would otherwise be there in a steady state Earth. 
And that is the idea here that one is able to tap 60 degrees centigrade, perhaps at only half the depth that it would be out in steady state Earth, uh, away from the radiogenic heated area. The idea that this well would perhaps be very difficult to find because there's no surface uh, expression of it would involve some geophysical uh, mapping and investigation. On the other hand, this other type of well where there is vertical cracks in the aquitard, steam may be leaking to the surface, vertical recharge may be taking place more or less constantly, and this kind of geothermal area, again involving a radiogenic heating mass below it, would be very obvious. There would be natural steam emanating from cracks in the ground, and therefore would be much easier to find. Both types of geothermal, both the open and the only discovered by mining, have been discovered uh, here at Largarello. Here's a picture showing some of the natural steam leakage across the valley, and zeroing in uh, on some of the geologic formations that are involved here. You can see such things as dolomite, calcite, uh, sandstone, uh, conglomerate, different types of rock porosity being involved so that there is the possibility in the valley below Lardarello, not surprisingly, of the, the so-called aquifer sandwich of aquitards and aquifers. The ages, you may have noticed, are from recent all the way back to Triassic about 200 million years ago. So Mother Nature took about 200 million years worth of crustal accumulation here to set the stage for the possibility of geothermal energy. Right in the center of the screen, you can see that there are also some faults which cut down across the green uh, dolomitic materials down into the underlying red uh, aquifer, in this case a sandstone. In some places of the world, the green dolomites would be considered aquifers in their own right, but everything is relative. And here at Lardarello, the dolomites are in fact the aquitards, uh, far less porous than is the underlying porous uh, red pinkish sandstone showing here, which is the site of the target uh, for the drilling of the wells here at Lardarello. And the faults themselves, you see, have the ability to bring natural leakage of steam uh, back up to the surface, as is shown here in a panoramic view of the uh, Lardarello Valley. Before we leave Lardarello, having answered most of the questions in a general sense about geothermal power, it's interesting to just reiterate here we're looking at the plant manager in 1904 and the very first generator using Lardarello natural steam. It was capable of lighting about a dozen 20-watt light bulbs. Uh, that's hard to, to have much uh, scientific excitement about in this day and age, but in 1904 Edison had just discovered the light bulb and it was indeed very significant. <laughs> Having concluded then our visit to Lardarello, we'll turn our attention further down the coast of Italy to the area of Naples and some of the interesting features in the Naples geothermal story. The idea that there are suburbs of Naples involved in this story behooves us to look at a larger scale map of the Naples area. And here we are in downtown Naples to the south and to the right in the screen is Vesuvius, and to the north and to the left is the suburb of Poisola, uh, Solfaterra uh, area. At Vesuvius, there is, of course, Pompeii as a reminder of volcanic activity, and at Poisola, the National Park Solfaterra is a famous area for volcanic fume activity. Starting first on the south and west side of Naples, we go to the historic excavation of Pompeii itself, the very familiar view perhaps of the yet remaining standing wall of the Senate building of Pompeii, 
Recalling that Pompeii was destroyed by a blowout of Vesuvius, shown in the distance, in 79 AD, Vesuvius is one of the types of volcanoes, of course, that should have a very symmetric cone, and you see that on the right flank there's a considerable chunk of the mountain missing. That is, in fact, volcanic material that's been blown out in various explosions of uh, Vesuvian eruptions. One of those explosions, a Nue Ardant, a very hot gas cloud, 8-900 degrees centigrade, uh, blew sideways with not a whole lot of warning in 79 AD and covered the entire town of Pompeii. Pliny the Elder was sitting on a ship in the Pompeian harbor and watching. Uh, in other words, there had been some warning as to the dangers of Vesuvius, and he sat more or less calmly aboard ship, writing up uh, the situation for all of posterity as the people were boarding ships in an attempt to evacuate the city, little realizing that there would be this catastrophic glowing gas cloud blowing sideways out of the side of the volcano without much warning. Going back into antiquity, here's one of the uh, engineered streets in Pompeii. You can perhaps see ruts in the street made by chariot wheels. Uh, the city planners of Pompeii were clever enough to put stepping stones so that people could cross the street without stepping into the street in the gutter. Jumping across the centuries from 79 AD to a newspaper from 1983, we see here uh, the idea that there has been a recent investigation of what's going on at the summit, an expedition guided by some of the professors of the university uh, task force, looking at the bocas or mouths of fumarolic, that is to say volcanic uh, emanation of gases, uh, and the activity at the summit. It is still, in today's world, uh, a, con a source of concern for the people living in Naples. There's some 7 million people living in greater Naples. This is not a very good quality newspaper picture, but perhaps you can see two gentlemen who have dug open one of the vents in the summit of Vesuvius, and they're still measuring temperatures of about 110 to 120 degrees centigrade. And the Italian government maintains uh, an observatory at the summit of Vesuvius with daily observations. The idea that Vesuvius essentially does shadow the harbor of Naples can be gained through looking at this view. There is one of the ancient castles which guarded the harbor of Naples, and in the distance the mountains to which Vesuvius is uh, portion. <laughs> there is today's guardian of the harbor, an American battleship, if you will, and panning on around, rather uh, foggy day in the harbor with some of the companion destroyers to the battleship, but certainly with insight and overshadowing the people who live in downtown Naples is indeed uh, the view, just to prove how much downtown it is, I'm shooting from my hotel window, Hotel Vesuvius, what else would it be? And here's a view looking down the street along the edge of the harbor, and as we pan out uh, across the harbor with the next door building, you see just over the roof of the building the profile of Vesuvius itself. It is quite concerned, maintaining the observatory, and just currently in the 1980s, planning to spend a great deal of money to monitor the problems. Going back to Pompeii for a moment as a grim, grim reminder of the kind of thing that could ensue if Vesuvius decides to blow its top again, there is here, very obviously, uh, visitors from the Orient viewing some of the exhumed plaster casts of body cavities that occurred when the Nuez Sardant exploded in 79 AD. In other words, when the hot ash blew across the town and people were trapped alive in the ash, as the ash solidified, the cavity was left where their body had been, and the archaeologists have been able to fill these cavities with plaster Thus, to the southeast of Naples, at Vesuvius, the reminder of the dangers of volcanicity are all too apparent. If we go to the northwest on the other side of downtown Naples, to Solfaterra, we come to an area that has been known for quite a few thousand years for its liberated volcanic fumes, the so-called Volcano Solfaterra. Solfaterra has given its name in a generic sense to any vent issuing forth hot uh, sulfurous uh, poisonous gases. There has been uh, essentially a park created in the suburb of Naples, 
And here we are, indeed, looking at the inner wall of the uh, crater itself with natural uh, solfatera type activity. As I said, it's given its name to this type of activity worldwide now. There, the small building is, in fact, uh, a laboratory built over one of the vents for the purposes of doing chemical analysis and other observations. The area here has been known to be active for about 2,000 years, and similar to uh, Pompeii, uh, for the history of the Italian peninsula, it has been an important feature. In recent times, however, the inflation of the crust of the Earth here in the Pocella Solfatera area has drawn a great deal of concern and attention. More about that in just a minute. The idea of the steam generating here, since we have looked at the cartoon during the Lardarello visit, we understand that there must be a source of some heat fairly close to the surface here. There must be some uh, chemistry release of the type of vapors going on here. These vapors are very hot, as has been being cautiously demonstrated here by one of the geochemists involved. We can joke with him a bit and ask him if the uh, potatoes are done yet. I'm not sure he'll understand our English, but yes, he did. You see, he's pantomining now, putting the salt on the potatoes. In a more serious vein, however, there's a very serious program going on in studying the geochemistry of the gases emanating here. We're seeing some of the uh, gas sampling techniques demonstrated here while we talk about it. The idea that there are components in the gas which are reacting as this gas is hitting the air, uh, but there are also components in the gas that apparently have equilibrated or reacted at deep positions in the crust of the Earth from whence they're emanating, and chemical data on the composition of these gases can be used in reverse to calculate what temperature these gases have, in fact, equilibrated at. At what temperature did they last react before they come here to the surface? So the two of the staff members from the University of Palermo are taking a very large amount of gas here, uh, trying to quench it, as it were, to, to lock in its memory of the source region from which it has emanated, take it back and do chemical studies to figure out what is uh, the temperature of the source region. As we'll see in a later slide, uh, depending on what kind of chemical uh, thermometers are used, temperatures as high as 430 degrees centigrade are being observed or being uh, inferred, really, for the source region from which these gases are coming. This raises a very serious question as to why is a temperature of 430 degrees close to the surface in a major suburb of a very large city like Naples? Monitoring of these sulfurous gases has been being done on a continuous basis by various geochemical probes. Here one being powered by the blue disk solar panel so that it doesn't need uh, human interaction on an hourly basis, but a probe can be stuck in the fumarole, in the sulfaterra area, and power generated by sunlight is used to run a chart recorder or perhaps to even run a small transmitter uh, back to a central laboratory in downtown Naples. Another aspect of the Solfaterra area and this whole inflation is that it has given rise to some rather uh, numerous uh, earthquakes and here we see some of the geophysicists actually implanting geophones to listen for shock waves here in the crater area. Some of the graduate students laying out an array of vibration-sensitive telephones, which the jargon word for which is geophone, of course. And the concern of the Italian government, again, is what is going on? Is there to the surface? Is it another potential volcanic eruption? Or is it some other kind of phenomenon giving rise to uh, the steam venting here, giving rise to the numerous earthquakes, and giving rise to an inflation in the crust of the Earth here in the Pozzola area. The electric industry in Italy is nationalized and works together with one of the petroleum companies, AGIP, and before the potential dangers of this inflation, a very large uh, blister in the crust of the earth here in the suburbs of Naples, perhaps growing to as high as 30 feet high over a five kilometer diameter area in just the last 10 years, before that blister was fully recognized, there was an effort 
uh, made for all good reasons to drill into the heat sources in the Solfaterra area and produce, as we're seeing here, uh, actual local, right in the suburbs uh, of uh, metropolitan Naples, uh, geothermal electric production. You're seeing the steam separating towers, the overflow lake for the recondensed water, with the idea that the produced steam from such a well could be used to turn uh, a very local uh, dynamo and generator. And it has, of course, the added attraction that it may be taking some of this extremely high heat, so shallow in the crust, and using it up in the production of steam, uh, thereby, if you will, defanging <laughs> some of the danger of a high temperature in a shallow crust area. Thirteen such wells were drilled, and it's now a very strange and complicated legal question as to whether these wells should even be touched. It's kind of a no-win situation. If the companies that own these wells uh, touch the well and something happens either to the inflation or the deflation of the blister, uh, they undoubtedly would be sued um, <laughs> by the people involved in the inflation and deflation. What about this inflation and deflation? It has actually broken up uh, many uh, government buildings. It has uh, almost a daily uh, occurrence of a news item in the newspaper, as you're seeing here in the Naples newspaper. Uh, Three million dollars for the uh, exploration of the ground around Mont Ruscello in the Solfataria area. Uh, schools have caved in. Uh, doors won't close in the homes. Uh, government buildings have had to been evacuated. This inflation is a very real thing, and it involves people so much so that the Italian government has started running uh, fire drills, if that's not the wrong word to use, on how uh, an evacuation of the two million people who live in the blistered area would have to occur if the blister starts to become very catastrophic. Here, in fact, is Dr. Marcello Carapezza convening the Society of Italian Mineralogists and Petrologists for the exact purpose of discussing what the scientific uh, sensibilities are of what should be done about this blister in the Solfaterra area. Some of the things that the symposium, the convention, in fact, discussed were the kinds of things that we've just been seeing out in the field having to do with the suburbs both to the northwest and the southeast. It was viewed to be essentially such an important meeting that there was simultaneous translation uh, for the various attendees, uh, some of the volcanological experts from Russia, Japan, uh, and other countries of the world were called in for their advice on what the best guess is that might be happening to cause this inflation, this, this uh, crustal disturbance in the Naples area. Here are some of the translators. Again, one of the staff members from the University of Palermo discussing his results on some of the types of gas analysis that you saw being taken in the large glass tubes. Uh, some of the equilibria, the chemical equilibria that were being analyzed in those gases. Here the idea of the reaction between carbon dioxide and hydrogen to give methane and water. And the chemists know full well at what temperature those reactions occur. The oxidation of ammonia was the second reaction that was being discussed. And you see here what we've already talked about briefly, that the best estimate is that this gas is emanating from somewhere where the pressure is 800 atmospheres and the temperature is something like 480 degrees centigrade. This graph is plotting against time on the, the horizontal axis, uh, gas variability on the vertical axis, and we see that as almost daily basis there are changes in the chemistry of the gas going on in the inflation area at Solfaterra. This again is a source of great concern. Why is the situation so unstable? Why are there earthquakes? Why are these daily spikes uh, and the chemistry of the gas coming out of the ground there? What, in other words, is really happening under those uh, suburbs? It has to be considered very carefully. Here we see the Bay of Poissola uh, and like a bicycle tire laying on its side over the community of Solfaterra, uh, geophysical map with the radii trying to give you some idea of the shape of a dome or a blister centered right on the harbor coastline itself where the pointer is showing. 
of uh, the blister, the inflation. You get some idea of the scale by the one kilometer bar in the lower right, that this inflated area may be as much as five kilometers in diameter, and since about 1978, it has in fact risen to 20 to 30 feet in its center. Here again is the review map, if you will, of the Bay of Naples. Here's Solfaterra and Poicella, where the blister was shown in the preceding slide. Here, by way of reminding you, is Vesuvius itself. Some 7 million people living between Solfaterra and Vesuvius. Along the axis now shown with the pointer, it would be fun to look at a cross-section. Here is such a cross-section, trying to give you some idea uh, and reviewing what we've talked about in our field trips out to Pompeii and up to Solfaterra. Here is Poizzola, here is downtown Naples, and here is Pompeii in the cross-section with the idea that there's about 17, 18 miles or 25 kilometers along that axis of concern. The blister that we have talked about growing at Poisola with the gases emanating there, threatening, if you will, downtown Naples. The idea that Vesuvius has erupted from a magma chamber with a great regularity once every 19 years for over something like 200 years. However, the last eruption to the summit of Vesuvius occurred in 1943, and Vesuvius, other than fumarole activity and some high temperature bokehs, has been rather quiescent since 1943. The question of what is going on under Poisola is, as we've shown you, concern of not only the scientists but the social uh, civil defense type considerations of fire drills as well. Integrating some of the data that has been put together by gas analysis and isotopic analysis and geophysics, the absorption of secondary wave, the model that seems to fit most of the data at this point may not be the final model, but it's the idea that there may be a geopressurized zone or an aquifer sandwich at some depth under Poisola, that the aquifer is charged and filled with high temperature steam between 2 and maybe 450 degrees, and that that is reacting like an absorber for the shock waves, the secondary waves that the geophone and, and geophysicist studies uh, have been conducting. Whether that geopressurized zone is at three kilometers or shallower relative to five kilometers for our cross-section here is also a question of concern. Is there uh, a temperature of 400 degrees this shallow in the crust of the Earth without a magma chamber underneath leaking its heat upward into the geopressurized zone is part of the model uh, consequence. In other words, if you infer the geopressurized zone, you must also infer some kind of very hot source, very shallow in the crust. It may be that the geopressurized zone, if real, is in fact uh, much shallower than shown here, but the more shallow one puts it in the crust, in a sense, the more dangerous it is uh, for society because you're putting very high temperature material very shallow in the crust, that is to say very close to where the people are. The idea that there may be a magma chamber at some greater depth does not seem to have been proven by the data thus far available. The idea that the 13 wells drilled through the blister down into the crust of the Earth have all intersected high temperature regions of the, of the crust without perhaps intersecting the geopressurized zone itself seems to be the case. The geopressurized zone, if it were intersected and if the model is right, would divest itself of a great deal of energy, not unlike opening a warm champagne bottle. In other words, a great deal of energy would be roiling out of the wells that had been uh, punctured. It's therefore perhaps a bit more understandable in looking at this cross-section as, as to why the companies that own the wellheads are so squeamish about doing anything more at the wellheads. The suggestion that there should, however, be some kind of a daily monitoring of the blister at the wellheads did seem to gain a consensus opinion of support at the meeting of the petrologists and mineralogists. The idea then of the blister and its leaking steam continues to be a very real societal threat to the Naples area, either with or without the inferred magma chamber. Thank you.
Это Джимми, это 